Hello students and parents, thanks for taking a few minutes to watch this video. Um, as things have sort of gone beyond the initial two weeks and then now we're doing online learning through April and then who knows what the future brings beyond that, uh, I've been pondering a lot about my readers and I, the, the reading, I, I just want them to continue to be good readers and to develop in their reading ability. And admittedly, that's a little bit trickier when we're, when life is different for all of us right now. So in this video, I just wanted to provide a few ideas around how we can support our readers at home. And uh, if it benefits you, great. If there's a takeaway from here that will benefit you, that, that's fantastic. If there's not, that's fine too. Um, I just wanted to provide this for parents and for students to think about, you know, why the reading we do at home matters and how we can maybe do it a little bit better. So with our online learning, uh, you know, I in my other video, I talked about my very first one, I talked about, oh, I've got this master's degree in instructional technology, I'm super excited to use it, and I found that it's a little bit trickier balancing act than I anticipated, because I want to be very respectful of home life right now. I know that life is basically way different for everyone than it was a month ago with uh, work schedules being impacted and, you know, maybe salary coming into the house being impacted. And so I don't, I, you know, stress levels are varying very much right now. And I, I want to be very respectful of that with, you know, the, the time of things that I'm requiring and, and just for that, you know, mental bandwidth for parents. So I'm trying to balance that. But I also want to keep the technology stuff super user friendly and flexible and accessible for students, which in some ways limits what we can do because I kind of have to keep a similar pattern so we're not relearning a new tool or something else every day with 10 year olds. And then the last thing is I still want to provide students with valuable learning. I'm not, I don't really want to be doing busy work. I don't, you know, I want to keep the student brain engaged. And so that's what I'm trying to balance. And it's tricky for me. And I know everything's kind of, tricky for everybody so we're just we're all in this uh we're all in this together so um you know those are things i'm trying to balance but what i want to talk about too is ideas around reading that we can maybe try to tweak reading in, in houses to make things just a little bit better so i'm going to talk really kind of nitty-gritty about reading theory and and the processing of how the brain works um, I don't expect you guys, anyone to know these, you know, know or memorize these terms, graphophonemic mapping and metacognition. You've probably heard of metacognition, but this first one is, you can think of it as exposure to words or how the brain processes words, word processing. And this metacognition is how we think about text. So I'll explain both of those and then kind of apply what that means for how we can learn better at home. So this first one, word processing or graphophonemic mapping, what happens is over time the brain starts to store letters and then it goes to word parts and it stores whole words and so you can kind of think of it like you know this, this ever-growing lego of the goal is to have words being recognized just by sight that we can see the word and we pull out that whole word as a single unit rather than smaller chunks so for example uh you know like a kindergartner at the beginning of the year they might they don't, they don't recognize cat as one word they have to go to, they have to go to the individual letters, which is what their brain is at. So, k at, and then over time, the C-A-T gets recognized as one chunk. It gets recognized as the word cat. And that could be, you know, a cat like meow, but it could also, those letters get stored as a chunk independently. So then over time, when a student is reading category, they don't have to read k at, they can read cat, a, gory, those chunks start to get put together and then we can move to categorize and categorization. So as we, the more text we're exposed to, the bigger chunks of letters and words that get stored in our brain. And that's really a much more efficient way to read is to pull out one word at a time rather than doing each individual sound or, or different word parts. But then it also kind of has this twofold benefit that the more we read, the better we get at kind of storing whole word chunks in our brain but also the more efficiently our brain can pull those out. Um, so it takes a shorter amount of time with less cognitive resources to pull those words out over time. So there's kind of that twofold benefit. And so the more efficient that we can recognize those letters and be able to process them and, and read them, then that leaves more brain power for us to be able to understand what we're reading. And so that's why one reason why exposure to text matters is because we get more efficient at reading those words, which gives us more brain power to think about what we're reading. And that's sort of the second part 
is uh, metacognition or monitoring our thinking or reading comprehension. The best way I've probably heard it described is the reading brain is like a multitasking driver on the interstate and you can even add with kids fighting in the back seat. Um, when, when you're reading a text and especially like developing readers, it's they're, they're trying to juggle a lot of different processes simultaneously. There's always a reason for reading, whether it's homework, whether it's recreational reading, whether it's reading a cookbook. We always have reasons for reading. So your brain is trying to measure your progress towards that reading goal. It's trying to process making meaning from the text and then figuring out what that meaning means. It's also trying to navigate how complex the text is. So sometimes that would be like road signs in the text that are showing that it's this type of text or maybe the text is a little bit more complicated so it's like a bumpy road. Um, but the brain is trying to manage all of these different processes at the same time. And that's it really is a juggling act because the end goal of reading is to understand what we read but to get there um, you know, it's, it's a multitasking driver on the freeway. There's a lot of different, as a driver, you're checking your odometer and you're checking your rearview mirror and you're making sure your surroundings and you're watching for road signs. And without going to too much depth, that's what the reading brain is doing as well. And so if you think about it as sort of like when you were learning how to drive, you know, if, if you had experience driving on the interstate and you kind of got to the point where you felt comfortable, but then as a 16-year-old driver, if you didn't drive on the interstate for six months and then all of a sudden you're expected to drive to Salt Lake, um, you know, that would be a really stressful and hard experience for you. And so same thing with the reading brain is that these, these comprehension aspects, the metacognitive aspects of our brain, they sharpen with practice, but they also start to erode with, lot, with lack of practice. And so um, this is another huge reason why I really want to keep our students reading during this online section is because I want to keep their brains thinking and, and still getting used to that multitasking aspect of reading. So to kind of combine both those ideas about the word processing and the constructing meaning, volume or the amount of words that we read you know, matters. And you might have seen this meme before. Um, it's actually inaccurate in a, in a few ways, but the gist of it works of, you know, if you read one minute a day, for most students that's approximately, they, they would come, they would be exposed to 8,000 words. Five minutes a day is 282,000 words, and then 20 minutes a day would be 1,800,000 words. Um, so the principle behind this is if we want students to be able to become more efficient word processors, and if we want them to be able to be better at multitasking their thinking during reading, um, you know, being able to manage those different processes, then right now exposure to text or volume is a huge, huge thing that matters. Um, you know, if my students were in class, we would really be hitting both of those hard, and I still am, am trying to, but also trying to balance those things I talked about. So uh, I guess what I'm encouraging here is that if you can find ways to expose your text, your students to more to higher volume or to more reading outside of school or even outside of the online learning or even just kind of maintain, you know, what you are doing. Um, you know, that's that I think is the goal here is to have them um, being exposed to texts. And right now that's tricky. So I have, you know, ideas and resources. Um, so the first thing is audio and text are both great here. You know, obviously the text part helps with the word processing more. Well, and the comprehension, but if you're listening to audiobooks, that doesn't uh, benefit the word processing part as much, but it still helps the comprehension part. And, you know, the, in, in my book, the comprehension is really the big fish here. You know, the word processing, you know, we can come back in the fall and get that stuff, but I really want the comprehension parts to be, you know, still chugging along and meaty. So I would encourage right now to have students in regular texts and audiobooks as well. Uh, ways you can do this is you can have siblings reading together. You can have an older sibling reading with a younger sibling or to a younger sibling. Um, you know, even, you know, if like, so like, for example, like, you know, like Harry Potter, you know, the younger, the younger kids, first and second graders, they can still understand Harry Potter, you know, if it's read out loud to them. Um, so siblings reading together, I have plenty of ideas of how to structure that and, and ways to think about that if you want to reach out for more details, especially if you want to help that younger reader get better with the text part of it too. Um, 
you could do a family read aloud or audiobook. Um, I just last week, I used Sora, which I talk about over here, to check out a book for my family. We're listening to 39 Clues, and we're trying to do about a chapter and a half a day. And that's worked really well just to help my dad, teacher, reader heart to help know that I'm keeping my five-year or my six-year-old's brain thinking about text. Um, you could have your student write a summary. You could have them retell it just to you. Just say, hey, what did you learn about in your reading today? And you can have the siblings do that with each other or telling it to parents. Or you can either have them write it down, you know, a little journal of, hey, just a summary. What did you read today? Asking questions is a big one, too. And then, ironically, if I, this is where I was going to head if we were still going to be in school. I was going to get really deep into questions. But um, there are different types of questions you can ask. Uh, so there are questions that are found right there in the text, uh, which is usually just a specific detail. There are questions you can ask that are think and search questions where they have to look a little bit harder. There are ones where they kind of have to make an inference about what the author was intending to write, and then ones that are kind of just based on their background knowledge. But the main thing here is I'm not going to be worried about which, you know, sort of complexity of questions that you're asking. I would just ask, ask your students about what they're reading, and then that's helping them sort of process it and be able to think about it and tell you, um, which is really important to kind of that construction comprehension part of reading. Um, and you can even ask them questions, even if you're not familiar with the text, you know, you can kind of still ask them and, and get a gist for it. Uh, you can do one pagers, um, which the, uh, I do this in my, I haven't done this this year as a ton, but it's sort of one, here's like an example of one before, where it has like an important quote that goes around the outside border. It has the title in the middle and they just do like a picture representation of what's going on. So this one on the outside says, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? So I have them pick a really important quote from the text and somehow integrate that into a visual representation. And so that way, if you've got kids at home and you're wanting to get them off the screen and they're done with the reading, this could be a great way to have them doing some art that integrates with some writing, with selecting an important quote, you know, with recreating what they see. I think that helps in a couple different ways. Um, resources. Um, my, I have a library. It's not like a huge classroom library, but uh, I'm trying to figure out ways that I can sort of categorize my books and make them available. And so that way students say, hey, I want that book. I can like, I don't know, sanitize it, put it in a baggie and leave it on your porch. I'm, I'm exploring that. So hopefully I can have ideas coming out soon. Um, Sora, which is an app. That's the app I, I got 39 clues from. It has both audiobooks. Um, and just, um, you know, ebooks that are really a pretty good selection. A lot of them are checked out right now because I think like everyone's using Sora. But you can find that from the White Pine Eagles website and then the student logs in with their seven crazy letters and then their password. Uh, the Richmond Library has some great online learning resources they're trying to do for, um, you know, this COVID-19 thing. So this first one, Scholastic Learn at Home, and it's got the username Richmond and password Library Zero Bookflix. Uh, this bookflix is for a little bit younger audience, and I haven't checked out the Scholastic Learn at Home, but you know those are great resources you can check out. Audible right now is doing free uh, books for kids during school closures, and um, I will put a link for that somewhere near in this email or Canvas page. And then if you have stuff that you're doing to keep your kids reading during this, you know, share those resources, um, you know, with me. I um, you know, I'm trying to rethink how how I can improve my end of the online teaching while still balancing those other things. And I just would encourage you that, um, you know, just evaluate the reading that your kids are doing at home. And if you feel that you have, you know, the time and the ability to make improvements or to even just keep the same amount but restructure or tweak the way things are going, you know, I would, I would highly encourage you to do the, that because you know, reading is important and developing reading, you know, is, is a big deal. Uh, it has a whole bunch of predictors of success down the road for these kiddos. And so if we can keep them reading, um, you know, during this pandemic and then throughout the summer and then going into fifth grade or whatever grade, you know, your other kids will be going into, um, I, th I think we'll all be grateful down the road that we were still able to support our readers during this. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments or anything, uh, feel free to email me and we'll just keep chugging along. Thank you so much, parents, for all the support you're giving your students at home. You know, that this, <laughs> this isn't ideal for anyone, um, but I, I genuinely appreciate um, the work that's going on at homes right now. So thanks so much for watching and get in touch if you need me. Bye-bye.